Yes, I want to thank everyone for joining us um, to this evening at the Fifth Avenue Synagogue Sunday night uh, programming. We uh, thank God have uh, been working very hard and have a whole slew of upcoming programs as well. And I hope everyone is enjoying their summer in a safe way. And tonight we have a very special program. We are honored uh, to have present to us Dr. Larry Norton, the Senior Vice President at Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center and the Medical Director of the Evelyn Lauder Breast Center. And to formally introduce uh, Dr. Norton this evening, uh, we have Lauren Merkin, Secretary of Fifth Avenue Synagogue Board of Director Directors. And we all know that Lauren really needs uh, no uh, introduction. Um, her and Ezra have a multi-generational multi connection uh, to Fifth Avenue Synagogue. Uh, recently, they were blessed with a grandchild, um, which marked the fifth generation of family engagement at the, at the synagogue. Um, her family is one of the key founders of the synagogue. And on a personal level, it's clear to all who uh, get to interact with uh, Lauren um, how she is such a kind-hearted, warm, and pleasant-natured uh, person as she is, um, a real uh, blessing to our community. And Ezra and Lauren uh, helped arrange this uh, program tonight. And so I'd like to call upon uh, Lauren to formally introduce uh, this evening's speaker. Although I can't see all of you, I just want to tell you how much I miss you. Not that I come to show that often, but I do miss seeing you. And I hope I'll get to see you all in good health very, very soon. I first met Dr. Norton in 1997. With God's help, he saved my life. He would be the first to admit that he didn't do it alone. He is a man of deep and probing faith and learning. His emunah, sorry, and Jewish knowledge are, and values guide his actions. He knows he has been blessed with an ability to make a great difference. And he works passionately and selflessly to help cure cancer. And he has made a difference. He's oh, finding many cures and at the same time also extending life and improving the quality of life. As a teacher and colleague, he is revered. He is a tireless researcher. He also has a twinkle in his eye and an ability and a desire to form deep friendships. He has been an important part of my family's life for decades. My ch children greet his name and presence with appreciation, awe, and affection. He and his wife, Rachel, are guests of honor at our smachot. For those of you who are theater fans, Rachel responsible, is responsible for helping to produce in New York City some of his best theater at Lincoln Center. Dr. Norton is an accomplished musician finding great joy in performing klezmer and jazz clarinet. Recently, I learned that he was an, ex an expert fencer in his youth. Mm -hmm. I am sure in time, I will discover many more of his wells of knowledge and expertise. For, there, for now, there is much we will learn tonight about the contemporary mm -hmm. state and future of remote medicine. I urge all of you to phone in on Sunday in August to what will be a deeply insightful talk on one of Dr. Norton's most passionate interests, Maimonides as a physician. Larry, thank you very much for your time and for your wisdom and for joining us. Well, Lauren, thank you so much. I mean, that's a very gracious introduction. I mean, much more than I deserve. And I sincerely hope you don't discover more about me because it actually may modify in a negative way your impression. <laughs> so, so I think I'm not worried. We'll, we'll sort of leave it as it is. As it is. Listen, I'm, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to speak with you uh, tonight and uh, about a topic that I think is, um, uh, let me see if I can get into the slides. A topic that I think is of, of great relevance and really has a, 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 Jewish, uh, a Jewish aspect to it, which is uh, social justice. And, and we will uh, we'll be getting to that as we go through, uh, as we go through this talk. What, what, you, what you see before you is I'm going to give a, a talk that's going to cover certain areas. Um, and the, the theme is telemedicine, which has had an explosion of utilization during this COVID national emergency. 
uh, and which, um, if I could ask people who are not muted, if you could possibly mute, because I'm getting some sounds out there, um, uh, and uh, has uh, become actually the bulk of what we're doing at Memorial Sloan Kettering right now in terms of internal medicine, uh, obviously not in terms of surgery, but still it's impacted the surgery because the surgeons are still using this to communicate with their patients. And, um, and our nurse practitioners, which is a very large part of our, our um, uh, force for taking care of patients, have been using this extensively. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about this as we go on and perhaps have questions about it. What I'm going to cover really is four subtopics, which is obviously why now during this particular pandemic. Um, the, second be, the second being, we have to get, uh, what are the uh, advantages and problems that, uh, that arise uh, by the use of telemedicine? Um, how laws and the justice systems have, have impacted and why they're important in this, in this particular kind of revolution in the delivery of medical care? And lastly, what the future might be as, uh, as we evolve toward the end of this, this pandemic by the development of uh, effective medications and effective, uh, effective vaccines, which, which will occur. And uh, if there are any questions about that too, that's something I'm very immersed in. I'm very involved in the development of both drugs and vaccines right now. And we could talk about that also during the discussion period. But before I begin, I'd, I'd like to talk about the, the concept of what the role of the physician is, because it's extremely important for understanding the role of telemedicine. And at some point in the, uh, in the education of every physician, they're exposed to this particular painting that's in the Tate Gallery in, in London uh, uh, in, in the end of the 19th century, which shows a physician um, examining and thinking about a patient, a pediatric patient in, 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 in this situation. And, and this painting really captures much of the essence of what it means to be a physician and why uh, it's important to understand telemedicine in this context. Now, for those of you who are not skilled in uh, or, or trained uh, in stylistic analysis of, uh, and formal analysis of, um, of artworks, there's something really intriguing about this painting that strikes me right away. And this is a digression, but I think a relevant one. And that is that if, if you look at the structure of this painting, you'll see that there is uh, a very prominent arm that sort of makes one's eye move along an arrow. Uh, and this really um, it, it captures also the crease in his pants and, and, and the tilt of the, of the lamp and, uh, and the, the beam overhead. And this is a, a tool that the artist used to make your eye move in, in a certain direction when looking at the painting. When you do that, you get a perfect equilateral triangle that captures the face of the doctor, the face of the patient, and the face of the concerned other. Um, it's, it's interesting that, um, uh, that the man in the background, which I think it's safe to assume is the father of the child, uh, some people don't even notice him being there because they're not, they're not, uh, they're not observing the entire painting. The, 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 the important part of this is that, uh, is that medicine is, is an equal partnership between the physician, the patient, and the concerned other. And each of them are bringing something to the equation that is critically important for their common mission, which is the health of the, of the patient. Uh, the patient is bringing the knowledge of their own life, the knowledge of their own disease by the symptoms that they have and what they present and the whole context of their life. Uh, this is augmented by other people in their lives who can amplify the, these, uh, you know, these issues in a way that can inform the physician. And, and all of this interrelates with the physician who is an expert in, uh, in what they're bringing to the table, which is knowledge, uh, intelligence, uh, experience, dedication, uh, in, indeed in the Jewish context, we could say loving kindness, and time. And time is an extremely important variable that we tend to forget about. Because no matter how smart you are, no matter how much you know, no matter how much experience you have, and no matter how dedicated you are, solving medical problems takes thinking. And thinking takes time. And time has been the thing so far in the development of medicine that we've had the least, the least control of. And, and indeed, with um, explosion of, of, of uh, needs in terms of the electronic medical record, regulatory issues, paperwork that's required in medicine, time has become extremely restricted. And, and, and until the, the pandemic, for every minute that you took care of a patient, you had to, you had to spend two minutes filling out the electronic health record. Uh, and, you know, in, in the days when we saw all of our patients on Tuesdays, for example, you know, I would finish about seven o'clock at night and I would leave 
the office about 11 o'clock or midnight because of, uh, because of record keeping that was really necessary. So all that is encroaching on the time that we spend doing the things that the physician really should be doing, which is basically thinking, making decisions, and gathering information because nobody now in, in contemporary medicine can know everything. I, I do believe that there was a time, even in my career, I'm 73 years old, I've been doing this for about half a century, and in my career, half a century ago, all the facts that I needed to take care of the patient were in my head. Um, essentially, I, I'm, I specialize in breast cancer and everything that I needed to know about breast cancer, I knew. Uh, sometimes because I was involved in the generation of that knowledge, because I could read, because I can go to the meetings, uh, and it was not necessary for me to have a strong reliance on other sources of information. Th those days are long gone. And there's just an enormous amount of information that one has to use to take care of the patient, even in the realm of clinical trial data, even in the, in the realm of drug toxicities, uh, but certainly now that molecular biology has become important, what are the genes doing, how do the genes interact, there's no possibility that any human can have all of that in their head at any one time. But you have to be able to access, access that information, use that information in real time to help the patient. So this is all a prelude to what um, uh, I would like to talk about, which is why has telemedicine become important? Now, of course, what telemedicine is, is, is technology, such as we're using right now to communicate, to communicate with patients electronically. The physician could be anywhere, the patient could be anywhere, the electronics connects them, and they could have discussions. Uh, but more than that, uh, that, uh, that the patient uh, can, can take advantage of the information that the physician can gather in real time by the use of a computer screen that's in front of them. But what motivated this change was not the advantages we're gonna to get to in a second, but rather certain needs that happened during the pandemic. One is access to care. Uh, patients had stay-at-home orders. They couldn't travel. Uh, even if they could travel, they didn't want to travel. They didn't want to be exposed. Uh, the dangers of exposure, especially when one is in a part of the country that had an explosion, as New York experienced, and now other parts of the country are experiencing, um, uh, that, that leaving the home is dangerous. And, uh, and, and that's something that people didn't want to do. So how are we going to basically access uh, the, the patient, the patient access our knowledge in that situation. Telemedicine seemed to be the right answer. Um, time, uh, that when we were consumed uh, with, uh, with, with the care of uh, the patients and with the care of COVID patients in the hospital, uh, we needed time to be able to deal with that and we had to maximize our time, our productive time with patient conversation. Uh, time spent going into rooms, out of rooms, moving people into rooms, uh, going back and forth between different settings. Uh, all of that was extraneous and was not important and we needed to maximize, maximize the time we spent with our patient and telemedicine really provided that opportunity to us uh, in, in terms of that. In addition to the fact that when patients would come to the office, we had to have a social distancing. We couldn't have too many patients at one time in one place. We had to make sure the patients were at least six feet away from each other. We wanted empty waiting rooms, which at Memorial Sloan Kettering we have actually accomplished. Empty waiting rooms or two people in waiting rooms 50 feet apart, for example, um, uh, during this particular time. And that means that it's slower in terms of inpatient, in, in person patient care, which means that, um, uh, that you have less time to be able to take care of a large number of patients. And we do have a very large patient load of Memorial and we take superb care of each and every one of them. Um, travel time uh, is, is, is basically a waste of time. And if you could avoid traveling to an office, if the physician can avoid traveling to an office, uh, that, uh, that is something that is extremely valuable. And we found this to be extremely valuable and all our producti productivity has increased enormously by not having to have travel time. Productivity of our, of our supporting staff has increased by 20% because they don't have to commute. Um, and they can stay at home most days and, and some of them every day uh, and that increase, increases their productivity. And also the, the work day is extended. If you don't get the work done by five o'clock, um, you can work into the evening, you can come back after childcare, after dinner, you can finish up your work. And it's easy to do so because of the ability to work from home, but that, that involves um, this as well. Um, I did a patient consultation this morning because this was the time that we could, um, that the patient and I could connect. And uh, that would be something that would really be impossible if we we're having a five day work week, for example. Um, and cost um, is indeed uh, fewer people are necessary to take care of the patient when you're actually doing it this way. And that increased the efficiency of medical care. Um, and, uh, and that is something we're currently still assessing. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we move forward. Um, one of the major reasons why we switched toward telemedicine was to preserve personal protective equipment, which was in great short supply during the great surge in New York City. And now tragically is in short supply in a place like Arizona and Florida is beginning. Texas is a really big problem now. 
um, to be able to protect staff and to be able to protect patients with uh, the proper kinds of face masks, face, face shields or, or goggles, uh, gloves and other protective equipment. Um, and to preserve protective equipment, we want to minimize the amount of time that we actually spent uh, physically in contact with the patient. Uh, and so that was another reason why telemedicine was a big advantage. We also wanted to be able to screen patients uh, for the use of emergency services. Somebody had a complaint, we want to be able to assess the complaint and see if it could be handled at home, which it often can, without having to have an emergency room visit. Because the emergency rooms are necessary to take care of COVID patients um, and also emergency rooms are great places to spread germs. And we wanted to minimize that. A social distancing in emergency rooms can be very difficult to accomplish that. You wanna use those spaces much less and therefore you wanna do as much as possible by telemedicine, what we call tele-triage. Um, and we also wanted to minimize, obviously, exposure to the virus and the need for testing. Now, most people would have assumed, yeah, that the reason for telemedicine was to minimize exposure to the virus. In fact, our hospitals have gotten extremely good at providing care safely. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, some of our buildings are, I, I would say, um, uh, thank you, Hashem, our buildings are some of the safest places you can be in New York City because of the screening that goes in and because of the um, uh, because of uh, the, uh, the safeguards that are really in place. But we also want to minimize the need for testing. And testing now is becoming a huge problem in the United States, again, because we just can't test fast enough and we just can't test enough. And in some of the states being hit very hard now, uh, testing is, in, is, 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 is a big problem. And you have to test to know who's sick so you know who to isolate, you know who to, who to, who to quarantine. Um, uh, people get colds, people get conventional flu. Uh, without doing the testing, you don't know if they have COVID, and so you don't know if, if their family members need to be tested, need to be screened. And eventually, and I hope very soon, we're going to have medications that we could use very early on when people have COVID to prevent them getting very sick and keep them out of the hospital. But you've got to know who to treat, and to do that, we need more testing. So you want to minimize the need for testing by keeping people at home as much as possible so that the ones who really need the testing can really get the testing. So that was for our motivations. Um, However, we had problems. And, 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 and one of the problems is in telemedicine is uh, some of the things I'm gonna list ahead that were handled to a very large extent in, in March early on by uh, a, um, an act, federal act uh, in the US Department of Health and Human Services called the Coronavirus, Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplementation Appropriations Act on long-term uh, this was proposed by Nita Lowy, quickly passed uh, through, through Congress. And this provided certain things that were really essential for us to be able to get up and running with telemedicine. One is that Medicare and Medicaid payments are very restrictive. Um, and they were, uh, could really be problematic uh, in terms of being, being providing telemedicine services and being reimbursed, reimbursed for it. And remember that the, the cash flow has to be there. Hospitals can only work so far Without having, without having adequate cash to work on. Uh, all of us have taken a huge hit during this particular crisis, um, some doing better than others, but there are rural hospitals that are closing now because they can't handle it, uh, be, you know, with elective surgery being canceled. That's a huge financial impact um, in hospitals. Um, and uh, all of the various arrangements I've already talked about in hospitals are very expensive. Uh, and so you need a cash flow. You need a cash flow, an appropriate cash flow for taking care of people. And some of the payment requirements were waived, which was absolutely essential for being able, being able to provide telemedicine services. Um, we needed access uh, to remote care regardless of geography. And here we get into the issue of licensing. Um, a patient that I'm taking care of who comes in and sees me periodically from another state, uh, I'm not licensed in their state. If I provide services, can I actually bill them for services? Is it legal? Am I protected in terms of liability in case something goes wrong if I'm providing services in a state where I'm not licensed? Many of us have talked for a long time about having national licensure. Um, it's, been, it's not happened. The states really depend upon the licensure for their own income. Uh, I'm sure that's a problem that could be solved. Uh, but this was a big problem potentially with providing telemedicine. And this was changed by this particular act so that we can provide services in different states. Um, also reimbursement, telehealth, telehealth services. And telehealth involves a telephone as well as video. When I'm talking about telemedicine right now, I'm talking exclusively about video uh, as well as, uh, as phone contact, because with video, you can charge at the same rate as in-person medical services. You can charge by time, which for a very quick interaction, a three or four minute interaction is a great cost savings. Uh, if it's a much longer interaction, it can be built at the same rate as what we call a follow-up visit, 
or a couple cons full consultation visits. And again, the cash flow extremely important for keeping uh, the motor of, of modern medicine really going. And so uh, previously telehealth services were billed at an extremely low rate. And now that rate's been brought up to the same rate as in-person medical services. And that's the absolutely essential for us to be able to provide medical care for people. Um, and some exemptions were put in place for HIPAA. Now HIPAA is a, is a law, we could debate whether it was ever needed, but it happened uh, to protect patients' uh, confidentiality uh, with a lot of restrictions. Uh, you know, husbands will call me and say, I've got questions about my wife and I've got to say, well, I can't answer your questions because your wife has to tell me that I'm allowed to talk to you about these questions. And then the wife has to reach me um, and, and, and give me this one thing. Uh, physicians can't necessarily speak to each other unless the patient gives express permission, which sometimes slow down um, medical services. But, but the patient confidentiality is what really is supposed to be protected by HIPAA. And that's very difficult when you're talking in this regard. And we'll get back to that in, in a second, but there were exceptions that were put into HIPAA, uh, in HIPAA to allow us to do telemedicine. And everything had to involve the patient accepting telemedicine services and consenting um, uh, to telemedicine services, which we put in place. Some people are not accepting this and some people don't consent to this and this has created problems because we, we can't as efficiently do in-person care as we did before COVID. But nevertheless, we're trying to do that. And then we hope that patient acceptance and, and, and consent will be increased and will be maintained. And we'll get to that toward the end of my talk. Now, the, the bulk of what I'd like to say is, uh, what are the advantages and the issues related to telemedicine? Well, one of the advantages is that, you know, here you see a physician um, who has uh, one, two, three, four screens going and a phone is that you have access to the patient records and you're looking at it at the same screen as you're looking at the patient. This is a, uh, a tremendous advantage because you don't have to take your eyes off the patient's face when you're giving them information, when you're asking them questions. Uh, the, the very skillful people, and I do this to some extent, I'm not as good as my younger colleagues at this, can actually enter into the electronic health record while I'm talking to the patient without taking my eyes off the patient. But you also have, have, have access to data, to, to laboratory reports, um, and, uh, and also some of the tools that are being developed now to allow us to be able to analyze complex molecular data and, and, and even diagnostic tools involving the machine learning and artificial intelligence. This is going to increase enormously over time. Uh, diagnoses that the physician may not, be, may not think of, um, you know, uh, younger physicians, you know, how would Larry Norton handle such a case? You know, they could access this using artificial intelligence. We're working on such tools. In other words, you know, he had, had built in more experienced physicians who've seen more to be able to guide uh, physicians who are less experienced and so on. But there are problems. And, and, and the major problems is lack of standardization, uh, lack of standardization of forms, forms that were developed uh, for in-person kind of pet medical care that are not, necess not necessary and may be cumbersome with providing uh, telemedicine, telemedicine care, uh, reports that are coming in on different platforms, transferability of information between computer systems and even within one system uh, can be very cumbersome and time consuming. Those are issues that we're gonna have to work on. One of the great advantages in telemedicine is the intensity of the interaction with the patient. Uh, you're looking at the patient in the eye, and I, I think there are tremendous advantages to this. And in fact, without distractions, without other things happening out in the hallway, and uh, without other things on your mind, that the intensity of the interaction is, uh, is, is to a great, deal, great, great extent much better, I think, uh, by using these tools. And the kind of questions you can ask, the kind of answers you can get, the intimacy of it all, the patient relaxed in their own environment, I think has provided a new level of, 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 of uh, physician-patient interaction that I think is very advantageous. On the downside, you can get a good history. You can do what we call review of systems, you know, problems with your breathing, problems with, with kidney function, with urine function, abdominal distress, and so on. We call that review of systems. But the physical examination is limited. Now, it's not eliminated entirely. And I, I, from my own experience now, and I've been doing a lot of telemedicine, I think about 90% of my physical examination I can do visually, uh, including things that require palpation by showing the patient how to palpate their own body and actually being able to observe, uh, observe when I see. But it doesn't substitute for, uh, for the tactile aspects of physical medicine. Can that be substituted by having a specialist nurse practitioner? So when the patient comes in for a mammogram, for example, we have specialist nurse practitioners who can examine the breast. Uh, I've got one that's actually doing th those breast examinations with my patient, and she's been with me for 15 years. I actually have two nurse practitioners been with me for more than a decade uh, who are extremely good at this, and that's providing it. Uh, the neurological examination is a greater challenge. 
uh, in this regard. So that's, that's something that we haven't overcome and that's, a, that's an issue. So the actual physical contact part of it is not going to be replaced. But we're also dealing in an era when uh, for breasts we got mammography and sonography and MRI uh, and we have better in ways of imaging the, the chest than the stethoscope uh, right now, better ways of, of imaging the abdomen, just fingers, you know, we have CAT scans and MRIs and, and sonograms. So that how important the physical examination is going to be moving to the future, I think is, is something that we're going to have to see and it may not become very important at all. But there's another thing that we should never been able to do before, which is assess the environment. Um, uh, you know, and we always look at the patient, how well they're dressed, how well they're groomed, are they taking care of themselves? And there's always part of the exa physical examination, but seeing them in their home has other advantages as well. And often there are other, there are family members uh, at home, other significant others, you know, we see their pets, we see their children. This, this adds really to the, to the intensity of the interaction in a, in a very, very positive way. But it has a negative aspect in well, which is confidentiality issues. One of my colleagues was just telling me that uh, she asked the patient uh, who's on the screen, uh, and how, how's your husband doing with his alcoholism? Uh, not knowing that the husband was in the room and that the husband did not know the patient mentioned the alcoholism to the, to the physician. Uh, highly embarrassing and maybe uh, has down, downstream consequences. I always ask, are you alone in the room? Can I have a confidential discussion with you? Uh, and that has to, be, uh, has to be brought in. But also, you know, there is hacking. And um, I, I take care of some people that are extremely high profile that I'm very concerned about this uh, in terms of people being able to hack in. We have tools that we use. I do most of my telemedicine by FaceTime now because it's so efficient. We have doximity, that is another level of protection, but it's a little hard for people to access, harder for people to access. Uh, some hospitals are using very sophisticated systems that are very safe, involving the patient portal, which is a, a website that the patients can use. And, and you really need a PhD in information technology on both sides to be able to access those. They're extremely difficult and very time consuming and cumbersome. We haven't solved that problem yet, and that's another problem that we have to solve as we move forward. But one of the issues that I think, and, and this has, a, I, th I think, a strong Jewish aspect to it. And one of the wonderful and great things about Judaism from the very beginning is uh, social justice. And there are barriers to the universal use of this technology. Um, uh, not everybody speaks English well. Um, and not everybody who thinks they speak English well speaks English well. Uh, we can use translators now legally with telephone communications, but not yet with video. We have trouble putting a translator on the same video screen with us to be able to actually translate into different languages. Can we use family members who speak both languages? Yes, but then again, that's getting filtered through the psychology of the family member or, or, or the significant other, and, uh, and we don't know the accuracy of that. So that is a problem in just that communication. Uh, in our office, we have in-person translators. You know, we have UN, UN experienced uh, translators that can basically every conceivable language on earth and translate in real time for us. That's not available yet in terms of telemedicine. Uh, this has a particular problem with immigrants and refugees, obviously, who are not uh, experienced uh, in English proficiency. I have found these groups, by the way, to be quite proficient in the information technology, um, you know, interestingly enough. Uh, is that that's not, that's not the issue, but language is an issue. Essential workers may not have time and, and so, you know, to be able to do this, and it has to be worked into odd hours and, uh, in, the, in this particular regard. And the big issues to people who are not economically advantaged, uh, people who don't have uh, stable income, don't have adequate housing, don't have adequate food, and those are tremendous preoccupations of theirs, but mostly in, in terms of this access to technology, not everybody has the tools that they need or the experience and, and the expertise they need to be able to access this. And this is something, a problem that really has to be solved. And we actually have data already that's accumulating in the literature is that the adoption of telehealth in our community health centers and in practices that have a high percentage of economically disadvantaged patients and immigrants, other uh, people with language uh, proficiency issues are, 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 are using telemedicine dramatically less than, in pay, than, than practices caring for more affluent patients. So this is actually an issue that we're going to have to address, address and, and wrestle with as we have more of a utilization of this, um, of, of this field. Now, lastly, what's going to happen when the national emergency is over? I, I mentioned the, 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 the act that has allowed us to do this. Um, are these changes in the laws going to be permanent? Are we going to go back to reimbursement that's going to be inferior for telemedicine uh, and it's going to make this really impossible? Um, we don't know. Nobody knows the answer to this question. Nobody's answering this question right now, but this is a great concern to the medical community. Um, will we see an environment uh, evolve 
with more or less regulations in terms of what we have to do um, and, and, and the paperwork we have to fill out and, 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 and the documentation of, the, of these encounters and the documentation we need for reimbursement. Are we, are we going to see, uh, we're seeing less regulation right now and this has been a tremendous freedom but that can carry risks as we know and so we'll see increasing regulations in this regard and, and how will that play out. Access to care. Um, how can we improve access to, to the devices necessary for this and broadband? Uh, large segments of the rural community um, uh, you know, don't have good access to broadband. I'm in a place right now that's not all that rural and nevertheless sometimes the internet goes out and, and, I, and I don't have the access and I have to wait for it to come back in. It usually comes back in within an hour or so, but that's an hour that I'm not utilizing for the services and I'm not that far away from, from, from New York City uh, in, in, in this regard. So that access is going to be a big issue if this is going to expand. Um, we have to solve the problem of language. We have to solve the problem of how we're going to have expert translation integrated into the space. And, and are we going to revert to uh, licensure issues where I'm not going to provide medical care to patients who are not in the states. I'm licensed in New York and New Jersey right now, but nowhere else. There are provisions for reciprocity that cover a significant percent of the country, but not all of the country, but those are also restrictive. Um, uh, what is the compensation going to be like and isn't going to be fair? And I'm saying fair meaning not too high, not too low. Are we going to be able to actually provide, our, our hospitals are going to survive under these circumstances? Will there be enough uh, income flow that our hospitals and our practices will be able to survive going forward? Uh, or are there going to be changes that are going to make it impossible to proceed? So the healthcare economics become extremely important. Uh, the confidentiality issue that I mentioned to you earlier is a major one. And, uh, and you know, it, it's a system that's just waiting for an embarrassing leak. And when that embarrassing leak happens, there'll be more demand for inpatient services. You close the door of the exam room, you've got confidentiality. And, and, and that's, 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 that's something that we've always worked around and that's something we've always enjoyed. How, how are we going to deal with this and how are we going to protect this? Are we going to have platforms that provide that confidentiality and are still going to have the ease of use uh, for people that are not that, that, that familiar with technology to get access to this? And, and mostly important, how, how is the patient population? Right now, people don't want to catch COVID. They, they're very happy to stay home. They're very happy with providing these services. Once we actually have um, uh, COVID licked with drugs and with vaccines, which will happen, I'm not sure it's going to happen all that soon, but it might. Um, uh, are we going to have a reversion to the old system? And are we going to want a reversion to the old system when we have all the advantages that I've already mentioned to telemedicine in place and we're starting to get used to it? So basically, why now? Because we had a national emergency and the national emergency has motivated us to make some changes that were probably long overdue um, and we were ready for. That's the remarkable thing about this is that people say that when you have a major um, crises, they don't necessarily invent new things. They just make things more ready to happen, happen faster. And I think that's what happened to us in, um, in the setting of, um, of, of, the, uh, of this pandemic. But now that it's here, we see the major advantages and we see problems that can be solved. The good news is that all of these problems can be solved and we have the expertise to solve them and we have the people to solve them. And, uh, and, and if we're sure that laws uh, will uh, protect us and allow us to be able to proceed and, and, and solve these problems in an economically uh, feasible way, uh, then I think that they can be solved and we could end up with not only a better system, but one that provides more social justice because we can reach people that could not be reached otherwise. Um, uh, and I think this is, a, uh, this is a major fact. And by the way, it's not just the United States. I'm doing a lot of international consultations now. Um, people, uh, telemedicine consultations, um, uh, you know, all over the world, um, uh, including the Middle East. Um, and uh, will this be a force for peace uh, when we actually start to erase borders? Um, colleagues of mine are, are, are thinking about this, erase borders in terms of provision of medical care and medical expertise. Um, and how is this all going to move off into the future is a real unknown. Uh, but it is something that I think is of enormous relevance to all of us, um, uh, enormous importance to all of us, and it's something that we should all be thinking about and participating in solving these issues. And I'm saying is that, that the people on this line right now, um, uh, we've got expertise in, experts in biology, I know, to help solve the COVID problem. Certainly uh, people that have had solved difficult technological problems in their own businesses and their own lives that could contribute to, to, to advancing knowledge in this regard. Um, uh, is this going to see an explosion of artificial intelligence and machine learning for utilizing molecular data, DNA, RNA, and protein data for helping the individual patient? This is a very good time to start to integrate those platforms, integrate that thinking. I can talk to you about my, some of my own research in this, in this area uh, you know, as well. Uh, we have people that are very much involved in the legal profession, 
uh, thinking about these laws is very important um, uh, as we move forward. And uh, together, I think that we can solve these issues and solve these problems. And it's a very exciting time, is, is in, adi in addition to being a very problematic time. But, but these kinds of challenges are also opportunities. And using those opportunities, we can improve medicine uh, and, uh, and accomplish uh, greater outreach in terms of social justice at the really safe time. Thank you all for very much for listening. Um, and I appreciate it. I'm going to turn my slides off. And I hope I see many of your faces. And I'm very happy to answer any questions, queries, uh, uh, contradictions, um, uh, and, uh, and your input. So thank you all very much for listening. And thank you uh, for, or, for organizing this, um, uh, you know, for Ezra, uh, Lauren, thank you for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Dr. Norton. That was an excellent presentation. Um, so enjoyable and interesting. I also want to thank Ezra and Lauren for facilitating your appearance here tonight. We're so grateful. And just on a personal note, um, it actually turns out that you were the physician for my mother-in-law, blessed memory, for many, many years, Rochelle Stark. And so my husband and I certainly owe you a very personal debt of gratitude as well for your outstanding care for her. Um, we have several questions that have come up tonight. Um, some have been submitted through the chat function or Q&A, and I encourage others to continue submitting if you have them, um, and some that were given to me ahead of time for the program. So let me go ahead and start, if you don't mind. Yeah, Rachel, um, is it, do you have some control over the screen? Because I can't, I can't see all the faces. I can only see uh, four of you. Um, is there some way you can control that centrally so I can see more faces? It just it helps me answer questions if I can see the, the, the people that are asking them. I don't think it's going to, I think the way that this was set up as a webinar, it will only allow me to oh, facilitate okay. the questions and not okay. for the individuals to ask. Okay, thanks. Sheila, is that correct? Okay, let's go on. Let's go on. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. okay, okay, very good. Um, I was just confirming with our administrator and she said that's the case. So um, one of the questions that came up was something you did touch on a little bit, but maybe you could elaborate. And that was whether physicians take on extra liability in relation to telemedicine or whether there's some acknowledgement um, that there are limitations to that framework. Well, right now, right now, uh, as part of that act, we're protected in ways we have been protected before. Um, and so, um, and so uh, the, uh, you know, the physicians could feel safety in doing telemedicine rather than patient care, uh, you know, in that regard, particularly in the area of confidentiality, particularly in the area of HIPAA. Uh, medical decision making is still medical decision making. You still have to be very competent in this regard. And, and indeed, not everything can be accomplished by telemedicine. And indeed, when you speak to patients, sometimes you say, listen, you really have to come in for physical examination and we arrange to do that. Or you have to go to our emergency department, we have to arrange to do that. And that's part of the decision-making process. Um, and so for medical decisions, I still think that there are liability issues that we have to, we have to wrestle with, um, but that we've had additional burdens in the past with telemedicine in terms of confidentiality, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, HIPAA requirements. Uh, in terms of billing, in terms of documentation, and a lot of that's been relieved currently during this pandemic. What we don't know is, are they going to be maintained after it's over? What happens if a national, if the federal government decides that it's no longer a national emergency? Uh, is, is that right now that act only applies during a national emergency? And when the national emergency is over, are we going to be able to maintain this? I think is the big question. Thank you. Um, another question was from our president, Jacob Gold, who asked about the origins of telemedicine. And he said that in an earlier conversation with you, you had mentioned that you started doing some of the telemedicine after 9-11. Right. And I was wondering about the earlier days of telemedicine and maybe how it's changed. Well, telemedicine really, I mean, the major, uh, the major impetus in telemedicine has actually been in, uh, er in previously in areas such as uh, psychology and psychiatry uh, for frequent check 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 in with you know with, with patients and uh, many psychologists have been psychologists psychologists and psychiatrists have been using this for many years and also for the management of chronic diseases canada has really has pioneered this actually uh, chronic lung disease chronic renal disease diabetes um, where frequent checking with the patient is absolutely essential to make sure that people are taking their medicines, they're doing well, they're not having side effects. And so there has been enormous experience. My own personal experience has been in international consultations um, uh, where uh, that, uh, you know, a, a case is presented to me by the physician or by, uh, by the equivalent of a nurse practitioner, or they have different titles in different countries. I can talk to the patient, I have the records to review, I have the records in front of me and I can give an opinion. And I can also talk to the physician, sometimes at the same time, sometimes at a different time and give my recommendations. 
Um, medicine is very challenging. Um, uh, it, it is not a cookbook. It is not, you can have guidelines, but, but guidelines are, as any chef who cooks in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the kitchen is an expert and knows, you know, a recipe is just your basic outline. Uh, you gotta, you gotta taste it. You gotta see a little bit more salt, a little bit, a little bit less of this, a little bit more heat, cooking for a few more minutes and so on. Um, there's an art involved in medicine and, and some of that art has to be filtered through the experience of the physician who's been there before. Um, and, um, and one of the great things that telemedicine has allowed us to do internationally is be able to work with well-trained physicians, many of whom I frankly I've taught over the years or have been taught by people I've taught. I'm not old, but I actually have senior physicians who've been mentored by people I mentored. Um, uh, and, and, and being able to communicate a case and say things like, you know, I, I, I actually, you know, 12 years ago I saw a case like that or 20 years ago I saw a case like that. And, um, and, that, uh, and that share that experience with that physician. So that's really been my utilization in the past. And now, um, so I was really up, up and rolling and ready to go with telemedicine when, when this crisis arose because I have such experience with it. Frankly, something that I've done, which I think is, um, we're gonna be starting to teach uh, some of our younger physicians is uh, tricks on how to do physical examination by telemedicine. Uh, and there are tricks, uh, ways of actually visualizing lymph nodes, for example, or visualizing masses or, or liver size. Um, that can be done visually, uh, vascul vascularity, um, other, other changes, um, uh, skin color. Uh, you know, frankly, some things can be assessed better because the, with the camera, you can take a photograph and you can do, you can do a close-up view even, you know, and, and expand it much closer than you actually can do with your own eyes in real time. My dermatology friends have said that they, can now, they now can do this and they can get real blown up pictures with high resolution of skin lesions and actually helps them better than doing it in person. So that, so that in fact, um, uh, there are some real advantages that could be, that, that could be uh, added. But this is on the basis of something that we had some experience with already. And, and, and as, we can, as a, we can all attest to, this was something that was ready to go. This was a, uh, a revolution that was really ready to happen. Uh, and it's just been accelerated enormously by this particular pandemic. But all the tools have been in place. And we've also learned that things have to be solved, which I covered in my talk. Uh, you know, many things that have to be solved, but they're all, they're all solvable. And I think that, that knowing that we can then move on and, um, and really improve this. So I hope it, I hope this is, and all of us hope that this is something we can maintain. Right. So, um, in the vein of the art of medicine, one of our participants has asked, your specialty is breast cancer. Does a woman who is having an appointment with you via telemedicine have to take off her shirt? And the, the participant says, aren't there limitations to this visual type of appointment? Um, and you know, how would you, how would you address that? Yeah, well, I, you know, I've been doing breast cancer with my major focus, but I'm, you know, senior vice president in the office of president of Morrison Kettering. I cover a lot of these diseases. My own personal consultations are largely in the area of breast cancer. Yes, indeed, the patient has a disrobe. That's the term that we use. Um, uh, and so we have to make sure they're in a nice place where they could do that. I've had zero problem with this. And the patients have had zero problem that I can tell with this. Uh, they have to disrobe in front of me personally when I'm examining them in person also. And so it's, it's just, it, has not, it just has not been an issue. Um, there's much about the breast exam that can be done visually. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into detail with this right now, but actually it can be done with, with, uh, you know, visually and with the patient palpating their own breasts under, under, under my guidance. Um, uh, in many ways, I could examine the axilla better, uh, actually the armpit better by telemedicine for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, but there are some things where palpation is important. But remember that, um, that, that you know, I'm, I'm an expert in palpation of the breast, and maybe it's so twice a year that I actually will find something about palpation uh, in, that is not picked up by mammography, sonography, MRI, and some of our specialized techniques, contrast enhanced uh, digital, uh, what they call spectral mammography and other advanced techniques. Um, a, a lot of the importance of physical examination uh, in, in the 1890s when that painting was, 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 was painted, um, have now been supplanted by modern tools of diagnostics. Um, and with, with modern breast imaging, with modern CAT scans and MRIs, um, uh, and, and especially with ultrasounds, uh, that, that we, it may not be necessary to do much physical examination, frankly, going off into the future. Um, uh, my Israeli colleagues are working also at, at, at techniques that could be used for palpation by telemedicine where a device can be put on a part of the body and, uh, and the physician putting their hand in the glove can actually feel and feel actually feel what, what would be felt at, at a distance. The technology for this is, is, uh, it, it, you know, is very advanced. Um, and I've been working, by the way, extensively um, with, uh, with Israeli scientists and 
uh, technology experts and especially mathematicians. Uh, there is a Dr. Larry Nord Norton Institute actually in Beersheba, affiliated with Soroka Hospital, which is also affiliated with Ben Gurion University, where we have enormous ex expertise in these areas. Um, and, uh, and a lot of technology has been developed uh, basically for military use and for security use that can actually be applied in this, in this, in, in this setting. Uh, and the expertise in Israel is actually extraordinary in this regard. And I've been very fortunate uh, uh, that I've been able to tap into that. And I do think that the possibility exists, especially for distant uh, consultations of actually being able to do some limited palpation by telemedicine, you know, mo moving forward. And that would actually totally complete the physical examination as far as I'm concerned. I say 90% I can do visually, the other 10%, uh, you know, can be done that way. Uh, and with modern Im imaging technology, um, uh, you know, even that, you know, may be augmented. So, so the world is moving very rapidly. And I, and I think that, that uh, it's exciting to be part of this. Uh, and I look forward to when COVID is finally over, when this pandemic is over, uh, that I hope that some of these advances that we're currently making that we'll be able to maintain. One of the physicians in our community has asked how telemedicine can address the detection of colon cancer or retinal melanoma or other cancers. Well, the, the colon, colon is basically is that people should get colonoscopies. And, and I think that, that, uh, that, that, that you're not going to be able to do this by telemedicine and you can't do this by physical examination either. Uh, you, know, the, you know, what you can do by rectal examination, you know, of the, uh, you know, with your finger is, you know, belongs to another era. I mean, people really need to do screening. And that's actually been one of our great concerns um, is, uh, is the fact that screening has really dropped during this pandemic. Um, uh, Memorial, uh, which is an active screening program, is now about 80 percent of it was before. But some people with 30 percent or less saw the hospitals around the country. And certainly in the hard hit areas now uh, in the southwest and in, in Florida, we're seeing a great drop in screening. And this has been a big problem. This involves colon cancer screening, lung cancer screening now, and uh, for heavy smokers and especially breast screening with these imaging techniques so that we really need to, to step that thing up. It's not gonna replace eye exams, obviously. Uh, you are still gonna have to look into the eye. Uh, and uh, right now we still need techniques for doing that. Um, and, I, and I still think that that in-person part of, of the exam is gonna be very important. But there too, the technology is really advancing. And um, you know, I can see health centers, especially in rural America, popping up that are very advanced in technology where we can actually put the machines uh, you know, to work where we don't need a physician, where one physician can actually work in many states simultaneously in one day and do these, do these various things, perhaps including eye exam. I'm not an ophthalmologist, so I can't really address that. But, uh, but certainly, um, it, since so much of it is imaging, uh, and imaging can be accomplished without the physical presence of the imager by, by advanced technology, that's something that's, that also is, is possible. We're just at the dawn of this field. Um, and, uh, and I can see where it could be advancing, even in, in those difficult areas, very, very quickly. Dr. Norton, one of our participants just sent in a note that you were the physician for their father, Irving Sclaver, 39 years ago. And they said he loved you very much. And he passed away in 2019, but not from the breast cancer, which he was cured of. Very oh. nice. So I thank you for all the, all, the, all, the, all the positive comments. I very appreciate it. Thank you. Um, let me see. Uh, we also have another question um, from one of our participants who's asking um, whether you see that doctors are less willing to spend time on the phone with a patient when they can get paid for a virtual visit. Any thoughts? You know, I think the virtual visits are much better. I mean, having done, having done a lot of telephone over the years, you know, being able to actually see facial expressions and be able to look somebody in the eye and talk to them is a tremendous improvement. I would like to see less phone and more, more telemedicine. Uh, it all depends. I mean, the reimbursements could get in the way. We can go back to phone. But I, I you know, having done both for, for, for a long time, and especially now, is I'm, I'm switching as much as I possibly can to, uh, to, to video. Having said that, some of my encounters with the patients are three-minute encounters, and I'm um, billing for three minutes, which is a very low rate. Uh, not, they're not full follow-up visits. Uh, full follow-up visits and call, call, you know, review of systems, you know, you know, some, you know, some physical examination, um, uh, you know, you know, et cetera. And it's just not necessary, you know, just, you know, you know, just checking in. Uh, the patient who had shingles and I wanted to see whether the skin was healing. So I did a telemedicine, whether the skin was healing nicely and got off the phone in three or four minutes. And so, and so um, it doesn't have to be very expensive for anybody. It doesn't have to be very time consuming. But, but, but video is, is really greatly expanded my ability to take care of patients. And, and I wouldn't want to see it revert for economic reasons, just back to, to phone, phone, phone conversations, except where that's appropriate. And it certainly might be. 
Um, not everybody is really has the technology, and that's the other thing that we're learning. Most of my patients do, but, but we're learning, especially disadvantaged individuals, don't have the technology, and so that's going to be a problem. And that could amplify healthcare disparities if some people are only getting phone and other people are getting phone and video, uh, audio and video. So um, I think it's something that we have to pay attention to. Yeah. There are so many tremendous advantages to this, though. I was speaking to my father today, who's a physician in St. Louis at Washington University, and he was saying, you know, he has patients who will drive in from southern Missouri, from towns like Poplar Bluff. It can be a four-hour drive right. each way, and this allows them to stay in their home and avoid eight hours of travel. Um, but I was curious right. how the geography impacts doctor shopping. So, for example, if you know the best practitioner in a given field is in California, um, but you live in Missouri, do you think people will just start to do telemedicine with that best doctor rather than find somebody who's in closer proximity geographically? You know, um, it's an issue. It hasn't happened yet. I, I think. I think. You know, the first of all, one thing that we didn't, the, one thing that we didn't mention, or two things I didn't mention in my talk. If I do this talk again, I'm going to add them. First of all, is you know, I could check in with my patients like often, like every three days when something is changing, which was very difficult to do in person. So not just the travel time for, for, for the visits, but also, you know, the frequency of you know, follow-up is very important. Also, you know, the ability to have a patient, you know, have lots of opinions. I have patients who have GI problems, who have neurological problems, for example. I've got a nurse practitioner who's a true world's expert in supportive care, things like pain and nausea and other things. And, and my one patient could in the same day speak to me, speak to a GI doctor, speak to a supportive care expertise and so on, which didn't exist before, the ability to do that. And so that's greatly augmented uh, the, um, the ability I actually to take care of the patient. So those are two other things, two other advantages, which I'm gonna add to my slide shortly, because uh, I think they're important. But I think that the, um, uh, but the question you're asking is one that we don't know yet. And actually, um, so uh, there's an organization that does a top doctor list called Castle Connolly, and, you know, and they publish it and it's on the internet and there's an abbreviated version of that that comes out in New York Magazine and so on. And I'm on the advisory board to Castle Connolly, um, a small group of, of, uh, of, of, of experts uh, who've been on the top doctor list for many years, most of us for many decades. And, the, um, and we were just talking about that, is that what happens when it's easy to access anybody, you know, are we going to see, you know, that uh, the people with the greatest reputation are going to be over, overburdened with the, with, with the needs to actually provide care and that less experienced doctors, particularly younger doctors who might be really very talented are, are, are not going to be on those lists and, um, and, and, uh, and therefore are not going to be getting uh, exposure to the patients and the patients are going to get the advantages of their, of their, their knowledge and their energies. And how are we going to basically work, the, work this thing out? And, and one of the things that we're talking about is um, using uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the really most experienced clinicians as a resource for other doctors. So that, so that yes, indeed, you, know, you should you know, see the doctor you're seeing and the doctor will talk to me and I'll help answer any questions or guide. For the most part, they're doing the right things. You don't actually have to intervene at all. But sometimes your experience and your knowledge or, or the fact that you know something about a drug that they don't know yet because it's not published, but because you're involved in the research or you know the people involved in the research that you know. So that you know, we may see doctors mentoring other doctors now to a much greater degree because of telemedicine. And I think that's made one way of solving the problem at the patient level but also maybe something that may be very important for, for the mentoring um, of, uh, of, of other physicians so that we have an opportunity, those of us with extensive experience can actually s spread our knowledge more broadly to physicians with less experience and how they learn from it. So this could be really revolutionary in that regard and we just don't know yet, it's all just beginning. But I think that this is something else that really could happen and could be extremely important. Dr. Norton, several of our participants are asking if you could share some thoughts about coronavirus, specifically um, uh, about projections for New York City, any thoughts about vaccine and or treatment. Uh, maybe we should do a separate talk on that, <laughs> you know, because, you know, I noticed that we have four minutes left, you know. Um, uh, I mean, I, there are important lessons here, all right, which is, uh, this is not a virus that is very easy to catch, all right? This is not measles. If this were measles, I mean, it would be a catastrophe, you know, the likes of which the world has never seen, you know, in terms of contagion. You, you, know, you, 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 you know, is that most cases occur because of contact with people who are sick or people who are going to get sick in one or two days. Those are the pre-symptomatic cases. And that's really the issue. This is the first time we've ever in the history of the world had to deal with a pandemic that was infectious, for people that looked healthy. Um, 
and uh, and that's really been been the, been the bigger issue. And in that regard, is wear a mask. Uh, I think eye protection is important. If somebody coughs in your face and a droplet goes in your eye, you know, you can you, you can catch it. So wear a mask, wear some form of eye protection, sunglasses, or you know, or something of that nature. Uh, these are my reading glasses, but I have this clear clear glass, you know, on top, so that it protects my eyes my eyes completely. Um, it's not that easy to catch off surfaces, frankly. Uh, that's not the major way you get it from touching things. And even if you touch something, if you don't touch your mouth or your nose or your eyes, which you're not going to if you're wearing a mask and you're wearing glasses, um, you know, it, it, it's not going to get in. You can't get in through your skin. So you don't really need gloves per se in that regard unless it reminds you not to touch things. But you do have to wash your hands. And 20 second hand washing and soap really takes care of it. So, so personal hygiene in terms of washing, cut, wearing a mask, I can't emphasize this enough. If, if you're wearing a mask and the other person is wearing a mask, you, you, know, you know, each one of those cuts the risk at least in half. So now you cut the risk by 75% of, of contagion by wearing a mask. And if everybody wore a mask, right now it's about one, infection, one, one infected person can spread it to about two or maybe a little bit over two patients. Um, and, and so if you cut that by 75%, this virus is going to go away. Because, you know, if you're only going to infect, you know, uh, you know, 25% uh, of that, you know, one person with infection is going to infect less than one person going forward. And therefore, the virus is going to die out. And so it's really not hard to get rid of this. And that's what's so tragic about this pandemic is that we can't, as a nation, seem to be able to muster the strength to wear masks, to provide social distancing, to stay at least six feet away from people and, and, and do that. Um, so, so really, it's not hard to take care of if, if, if you know, if we did that. Um, and so, and, and we've learned this in terms of national experiments and people who've, who've you, know, uh, you know, countries, whole countries that have got this thing under control, they got this under control this way without a drug, without a vaccine. Drug development is, I think, something that's really imperative. I've been involved in, uh, in trying to bring a huge international effort called REMAP-CAP. You can Google it, REMAP-CAP, into the United States. It's called an adaptive trial, which means nobody gets randomized to placebo. Everybody gets an active agent, and it's a lose the loser. You know, it's something that's not panning out compared to the other drugs being used. You drop it, and you keep moving on and adding drugs to it. It's a fantastic trial. It's the national trial in the UK. It's led to some advances already. It's the national trial in Canada and Australia and New Zealand and many other countries. I just can't get, and, and the people that are passionate about this, we can't import this trial into the United States. Uh, and it's really critical that we get that trial in the United States. I was able to raise about a million dollars from friends of mine to be able to bring this trial into certain uh, hospitals that I have some affiliation with. Uh, we need a, 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 a New York consortium of hospitals, Cornell, uh, NYU, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Mount Sinai. We all want to form a New York consortium of doing this particular trial, but we need the funding to do so. And it's been very hard to raise the funds for doing it. Um, uh, and frankly, I, I think some of the out trials that are out there now are wasteful, they're duplicative, they involve placebo controls, which I think is unethical in this environment. I mean, somebody that's that sick with COVID, you know what's going to happen if they get a placebo. It's not, it's not going to be pretty. And so I think that we need this adaptive trial design. So anybody out there who wants to support my efforts in remap cap, please give me a call uh, because it's critical that we have a New York consortium ready to go. I will say in this regard, before I talk about vaccines in a second, I will say in this regard is that I'm really worried about COVID-19. I think we're going to defeat it moving forward. But I'm also worried about COVID-21, COVID-22, COVID-23. I don't think this is going to be the last pandemic we see in our lifetimes. Um, and uh, with international travel uh, and with other issues, uh, it is very possible we're going to have to deal with other pandemics. And they might be more infectious and more lethal than what we're dealing with. We can't control what viruses are going to do. But we can be ready for them. And we can be ready for them with public health. We can be ready for them, which the United States was not prepared for. We can be ready for them with vaccine development technology. Right now, we have uh, almost 150 companies that are developing vaccines. We got some of the ones that look most promising. Some of them are in humans already to test. Uh, I'm involved with development one right now that's actually looking pretty, pretty good. It's going to go into humans in September. Um, uh, I think we are going to have vaccines. I think if everything works out right, I'm not sure whether it's realistic that we'll have vaccine by the end of the year, but I think by the end of the first quarter of next year, but, but having a vaccine that works uh, is not necessarily the end game because we have to be able to manufacture it, we have to distribute it, we have to make sure that people take it. And there's a very strong anti-vaccine movement that's out there right now that we're gonna have to contend with because a lot of people won't even take a vaccine even to save their life, to save the life of their children. Um, uh, and that's gonna be something that we're gonna have to contend with uh, you know, in, in moving forward. Um, it has to be affordable. 
and that's going to also also raise raise uh, significant issues and it has to be safe and we're not going to know that it's safe for a while uh, because it really enough people have to be treated to actually see what happens we, very likely with modern vaccine technology it will be safe but we're not going to know until it's tried until we actually have the clinical data and that's going to take time uh, so eventually COVID-19 will be defeated but it's not going to happen instantaneously and I'm, I'm saying is that all of us have to be aware that we're going to have to be ready for other infectious diseases caused by viruses um, uh, you know bubonic plague maybe having a comeback. Fortunately, we've got drugs for that already, so I'm not that worried about that. But we have to be ready for other pandemics that may occur uh, sometime in the future. Anybody wants to talk to me in more detail about this, please do. Uh, you know, and if you want to, I can give another lecture on this whole topic. Uh, but this is a very, very good question and extremely important for all of us to keep in mind. Thank you. I do see that one of the participants has a hand raised. And if you'll in, uh, forgive me that I'm not... Um, so adept at this, but I'm going to try to allow this participant to ask their own question. So if you'll give me just a second, I'm going to try and do that. Okay. All right, I see, I see the person with the raised hand still is muted, if they can unmute. Oh, okay, thank you. It's so, um, N. Zenworth is the name, if you yeah. want to ask your question, right, just then, unmute yourself. Yeah, you unmute yourself on your phone, lower left-hand corner of the screen. You're still muted. Well, maybe I can look in the chats and see if there's a... Um, okay. Now, I've I don't all, think that I, question... I, yeah, I, I don't I've think been, that I've answered, I've answered all the chat questions, so... Okay, okay. Um, well, Dr. Norton, I just want to thank you so much. Personally, I could listen to you for hours. <laughs> so I, I just want to thank you so much. This was so interesting. And um, I'm very eager for your next talk already. My mom is a physician. We're very grateful to you for appearing in front of our community. And, and thank you very, very much. Um, Rabbi, are you still on? Thank you. Thank you for the honor of the invitation. Thank you, oh, Rabbi. What, what, a, what a treat. Thank you. It was thank a privilege you. for us. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Rachel, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Norton, for this uh, fascinating presentation. And one of the great challenges in rabbinic Judaism is that as uh, reality changes, uh, to adapt to the new reality, but yet to still remain true to one's ideals and one's uh, um, values. And it sounds like uh, in the medical profession, they grapple with the same type of uh, reality. And I assume from a, from a patient's perspective, there's also a tremendous benefit because many patients have a lot of anxiety walking into a uh, doctor's offices and uh, and um, time constraints as well. But in terms of um, maintaining a relationship, you know, have you seen the same amount of success gen starting new relationships with patients as, as maintaining yeah. relationships? Or, you know, because it's one thing to have, know something, someone for many years and then just to move it online. But to start from scratch, do you think that'll be um, successful as well? Well, Rabbi, you, you mentioned that the similarities between practice of medicine and, and, and rabbinic Judaism is actually Maimonides, one, my favorite quotes, basically, he, he said that the practice of medicine is, uh, is an act of worship. Uh, it's, been, it's been a guiding principle for me my entire life. And so, you know, I think that there are, there are, there are strong similarities. I think that that was, that's, uh, and you mentioned one of the important ones is staying true to your ideals and, and principles and still moving on and adjusting to, to changing times. Um, um, I, I have, I've done new patient consultations and I've established, I think, very good rapport with those individuals. Um, uh, you know, uh, is it quite the same? I don't know. I mean, probably not, but we all know that there's some time in the future that we're going to, you know, meet and that we'll have a, a physical meeting and it'll be like, you know, you know, you know, old friends finally, finally coming together. And so, and so that knowledge that this is going to end someday and we return to normal life, I think has been motivating that. But as we get better and better at this, I, I, you know, I'm not sure. And um, I have relationships with some patients that are overseas who I've never seen in person, yet we have, we have you know, good conversations. And there's a sense of intimacy you know, by involving the screen uh, that, is, uh, that, I, that I think is, is very real. And especially with younger people, 
who are, are so oriented to the screen and to social media and, and digital technology that they, they, I think it's easier for them to establish relationships this way uh, and, um, uh, you know, and, and, and maintain those relationships. So again, too, we're all in the process of learning and uh, we just have to sort of see the way it plays out. But being sensitive to this, I think, is, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is a very important part of that process of continual improvement. Thank you so much, Dr. Norton. Uh, we look forward to your presentation in August. And please, add, uh, we, we bless you. We be blessed uh, with good health uh, to continue, your, your, as you know, your work of God. You are God's uh, Hashem's partner uh, to create life and to save life. And please, God, it should continue for many, many years in, in good health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Everyone should have a wonderful evening.